Hello and welcome to lecture 10 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today we're going to have our third lecture on knowledge representation strategies. In particular today we're going to cover semantic webs, trees, and since we're on the topic of trees, we'll also cover some other tree-based machine learning methods. Our last class was focused on some different knowledge representation strategies. This included an array of basic knowledge organization systems, then we took a closer look at ontologies, then the specific Go ontology or gene ontology, learned how we could apply Go for functional annotation, and then lastly covered some other popular medical ontologies. In today's lecture, we'll start off by covering semantic webs, then we'll take a look at trees as a knowledge representation strategy, as well as use this as an opportunity to learn how tree representations can be used in machine learning, in particular as decision trees. Then we'll end by expanding on decision trees to a number of other tree-based machine learning approaches. This will be a quick diversion from our main deductive reasoning focus in this course, taking a moment to look at some different inductive reasoning approaches, in other words, machine learning approaches. So let's start with semantic webs. You might recall in our last lecture that we covered a number of these knowledge organization systems, and we briefly mentioned semantic webs. So here we're going to take a little time to expand upon semantic webs, which we learned so far are linked data semantics on the World Wide Web. What we might consider to be the first version of the World Wide Web is basically a collection of distributed hypertext and hypermedia. So we have web pages like this with text and hyperlinks that bring us to other pages with other text and hyperlinks. Information is basically accessed via a keyword-based search or through browsing that allow us to digest all the information that's available. But what are the limitations of the web as it's organized in this current way? Well, first off, web search results are high recall but low precision. In other words, we're able to find a mess of the things we're looking for, but that comes with a lot of stuff that we're not looking for, so we have to sift through it. Also, the results of a web search are highly sensitive to the vocabulary used. Additionally, results typically come in the form of a single web page. And further, most of the publishing contents are not structured to allow any form of logical reasoning or query answering. However, there are some signs that the web is developing into something new that might be more useful in the future. One such step is the inclusion of folksonomies, which we learned about previously. Basically, through crowdsourcing, individuals are beginning to tag all sorts of entities on the web to make them easier to be found and accessed. Again, this can include things like pictures or videos or discussions, papers, anything. So what is a semantic web? Well, the original web was invented by Tim Berners-Lee, among others, who was a physicist working at CERN. His vision of the web was much more ambitious than the reality of the existing web, which we can think of as more of a syntactic web. In other words, there's a defined and fairly unified structure but not so much a defined and universal underlying meaning. Originally, Berners-Lee envisioned a web that was a set of connected applications forming a consistent logical web of data. He also thought of it as an extension of the current web in which information is given well-defined meaning, better enabling computers and people to work in cooperation. This vision of the web has become known as the semantic web. It's worth quickly clarifying here that a semantic web is not the same thing as a semantic network or a semantic net. So what's the problem with the web as it's typically set up right now? Well, consider a typical web page like this. Well, underlying this page is a computer markup language that's focused on rendering information such as the font size and color and including hyperlinks to related content. This setup is really designed for human interface and interaction but they were never really designed for computers to easily navigate and utilize. So what's the proposed solution to help computers to more easily utilize and navigate the World Wide Web? Well, it comes down to adding semantic annotations to web resources. For example, here's my profile picture at UPenn and some information about myself. However, this is just raw text. A computer would need a lot of background knowledge in order to figure out that this is a city. This is a position, this is a name, this is a degree, and so on. Instead, we can take this raw text and embed it with semantic tags that clarify the underlying meaning behind each bit of text. In this case, we have the semantic annotations person flanking my name, indicating that I'm a person. 
the text that describes my position is flanked with these semantic annotations of job. In this case, University of Pennsylvania is my employer, and the location is Philadelphia, PA. These annotations are meant for machines to work with, not human beings, which can infer this context without help. So in some sense, this is kind of what a semantic web is all about. The goal is to add a universal set of computer-readable tags or annotations to text or other objects we might be interested in automatically making computer accessible and understandable. But that was just the start. Going further, an alternative approach is to represent web content in a form that's more easily machine accessible and to use intelligent techniques to take advantage of these presentations. But first, we need an agreed upon set of annotations that will be used universally. This brings challenges in terms of flexibility and extensibility. Further, in creating this formal set of annotations, there will always be some limited number of things that can be expressed. Sometimes subtlety or nuances could be lost. The annotations that could be used by semantic webs can come from ontologies. This is useful because ontologies usually already have a standardized set of terms with associated meanings. And given that the semantic web includes lots of areas, it will be necessary to combine or relate terms across multiple ontologies. One step in this direction is through the use of HTML and XML. These are both web page creation languages. HTML describes the presentation of the page, and it's not inherently human readable. On the other hand, XML describes content that is both human and machine readable. Here's an example of HTML that's basically illustrating how this text will be formatted on a given web page. For example, this indicates that this text is to be given as a header. Here we see an example of XML. Notice that XML goes beyond HTML in that we're not just worried about formatting and presentation, but now we're also tagging content in order for in order for machines to identify and understand what that content actually is. However, neither HTML or XML convey semantics, meanings, or utilize a standard terminology for contents. So the next more slightly advanced step is something called Resource Description Framework, or RDF. RDF is a standard of the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C. This group is responsible as the main international standards organization for the World Wide Web. One thing that RDF does is to add relationships between documents. This is done through triplets or sentences. For example, we have a triplet here, subject, property, and object, where our subject is Mozart, the property is composed, and the object is the song, the magic flute. This kind of basic RDF schema extends RDF with standard ontology vocabulary. In other words, a class is a property, a type is a subclass of, and a domain specifies a range. However, there's no precisely described meaning or inference model designed to work with RDF as is. Ultimately, RDF provides metadata about web resources using these object attribute value triplets. RDF relies on an XML syntax, and any of these chain triples can form a graph. For example, let's start with the hyperlink to my lab web page. In this case, an object representing my name has email and then the email itself, the value. Here we can see how this might be written in RDF. Notice that this is somewhat similar to how edges and nodes play a role in a semantic network. Here we see some other triplets involved in the creation of an underlying graph. Ryan Yu has teaching and then this course, and this course has owner Beeman. RDF can also be used to point out relationships between other things that aren't just text. For instance, we're linking my name to my work photograph, which happens to be available at this link. However, we've still only scratched the surface of possibility in terms of moving the semantics of the World Wide Web forward. The next step involves going out of our way to really add these ontologies to create a semantic web. In other words, adding ontological terminology standards that will allow for inference to take place. OWL stands for Web Ontology Language, designed for semantic webs. Currently, OWL is the W3C recommendation. In other words, it's the preferred standard. OWL is based on something called description logics, which is another knowledge representation formalism. 
As such, OWL has benefited from many years of description logics research, which has a well-defined semantics with formal properties that are well understood, in other words, complexity and decidability, and it has known algorithms for reasoning that can be used with it. Also as a language, it's been implemented in a highly optimized way, so it's a very efficient framework. Presently, there are three species of OWL. The first, OWL full, is a union of OWL syntax and RDF. Then there's OWL DL, which is a variant that's restricted to first order logic. And lastly, there's OWL light, which is an easier to implement subset of OWL DL. Presently, there's a new version, OWL 2, which has improved data types for flexibility and ongoing development. In this slide, we try and illustrate a sample ontology that might be working behind the scenes in a semantic web. Here, all the orange nodes and connections illustrate the basic ontology that's working behind the scenes in this example semantic web. So we have things like a PhD student is a student, but it's also a researcher, and both a student and a researcher are people, and a person is an object, where an object is most the general type of entity in this ontology. And we can see there's a number of other connections or relationships between these different types of objects. We can also see where different objects are connected to items that might be available on the net. Here, the PhD student object usually has specific information attached to it. In this case, maybe any papers they've published, their telephone number, and their affiliation. With these standardized set of relationships, we can create an instance of a PhD student that has all of these elements attached to it. And these might be items that are available on the web, linked as resources. This kind of ontology and semantic web can have a number of rules that are underlying it. These rules allow us to do some basic automatic inferences. For example, if T, a topic, is described in D, a document, we can also conclude that that document is about that topic. Or if a person writes a document about a certain topic, we can conclude that that person knows about that topic. This example is to basically illustrate how we can now use an ontology with relationships, use it to create a semantic web linking resources on the web, and then through having this formally set up ontology with, with predefined inference rules, we can automatically make conclusions about some of the resources out here on the web. This can help us to more easily find information that we're looking for, and to do so with higher precision. The major paradigms between inference in a semantic web come from logic programming and description logic, and they rely on standards such as RDF and OWL. Since we brought it up, let's take a quick look at description logics. As we mentioned, description logics are a family of formal knowledge representation languages. For context, they are more expressive than propositional logic, but less expressive than first order logic. They can model concepts, roles, and individuals, as well as their relationships. A fundamental modeling concept of description logic is something called the axiom, which is just a logical statement which relates roles and or concepts. Annoyingly, description logic uses a different set of terminology. For example, from first order logic, a unary predicate would be considered a class in OWL and a concept in description logics. A constant in first order logic would be called an individual in an OWL as well as in description logics. And lastly, a binary predicate in first order logic would be called a property in OWL and a role in description logics. Description logics is all about ontological reasoning, where our goal is to answer queries over ontology classes and instances. For example, to find more general or specific classes, or to retrieve individuals or tuples matching a given query. Here's a further illustration of this idea where we have different concepts of lawyer, doctor, and vehicle, and these are captured two-dimensionally by these dotted green ovals. Individuals here are dots that illustrate people in this case, so John and Mary. Roles are relationships between individuals. In this case, a blue arrow is has child, and a red arrow is owns. So imagine that this larger circle represented our description logics-based semantic web. And we wanted to look for individuals that were both lawyers and doctors. We could apply description logics in this case to find the individuals Mary and John that happen to be both lawyers and doctors. So what are the main advantages of description logics? Well, first off, there are two kinds of inference tasks in description logics. The first is subsumption, and the second is classification. 
Subsumption is checking if one category is a subset of another based on their descriptions. And classification is checking if an object belongs to a category. Both of these tasks have what's called polynomial complexity. This basically captures the complexity of the search that's required to get an answer. And polynomial complexity is much less expensive than, let's say, exponential complexity. Another advantage of description logics is that they have a clear semantics, which makes them a good knowledge representation formalism for applications with a large declarative component. Notably, the semantic web language OWL is built upon these description logics. So what are the disadvantages of description logics? Well, first off, polynomial inference is assured by the definitions of categories. In other words, if they are small and correctly defined, then the inference tasks are easy to carry out. However, if the categories are hard to define in a concise manner, then their descriptions may become exponentially large. So here we have a complexity of big O two to the end, or an exponential complexity. Furthermore, description logic are considered to have weak inference capabilities in order to preserve their decidability, which is the trade-off. As such, description logics can't handle imprecisely specified concepts, nor fully enforced relations between them. If you're interested in learning more about the development of semantic webs or description logics, there are a number of different editors or environments that are available within which you can build and edit them. Probably the most popular is one called Protege, but there's others including Oiled, Swoop, Construct, and Ontotrack. Some of these tools are also great for building ontologies. A closer look at Protege, it's a free open source ontology editor and framework for building intelligent systems. It's available at this web link. Stepping back, semantic webs offer an ideal platform for representing and linking biomedical information between hospitals and clinics, research institutions, publications, and the global research community at large. One example of this is Semantic Medline. This is a web application that summarizes Medline citations returned by a PubMed search. Here, natural language processing is used to extract semantic predications from titles and abstracts. At this point, it shouldn't take much to realize the potential value of semantic webs in medicine. Ultimately, we can use these structured knowledge repositories of ontologies and semantic networks to connect to resources across the World Wide Web. Resources such as publication literature, medical guidelines, patient data, study data, and potentially so much more. All of this ultimately yielding a unified biomedical knowledge network allowing us to connect and find information much more readily and precisely. Of course, there are trade-offs when it comes to having semantic clarity. This very rough figure illustrates the trade-off between having a high semantic clarity versus the amount of time and money that goes into creating and maintaining them. Obviously, a well-developed semantic web or ontology takes a lot of time, effort, organization, and expertise. Now we're going to leave semantic webs behind and talk about tree representations with decision trees. This slide represents the rest of the representations that we're going to consider closely in this course. In particular, trees and rules. As we already know, different knowledge representations are utilized throughout artificial intelligence. But these last two representations are commonly used in both machine learning and expert systems. These include trees, in other words, decision trees, and rules, which are found in rule-based systems, which we'll learn about a little bit in our next lecture. Both of these representations are convenient for storing existing expert knowledge for use in reasoning systems like an expert system. Also in both cases, inductive learning could be applied to train these representations to store probabilistic relationships derived from looking at specific examples in, for example, a training set. Before diving into the specifics of these representations, let's take a quick glimpse at machine learning in general. In machine learning, there are lots of different representations that you could possibly apply from which to learn and store knowledge. One of the simplest, of course, is a regression model. In this case, we have our dependent variable, our y-intercept, an independent variable with a coefficient, and some random error term. But this is just one of many possible ways to represent learned relationships in data. Here's an example of a basic tree that we'll learn more about today. Here we have an example of different if-then rules, which we'll learn about more in our next lecture. And we also have representations like networks, or neural networks and deep learning. 
All representations have different advantages and disadvantages, typically which come from the assumptions that are made in using each representation. This is also a good time to review that there are different kinds of learning that can take place in machine learning. There are three main types in particular. The first is supervised learning. Here we have labeled data, where we know the outcome of each individual in the data set. This outcome can either be discrete, as is the case in classification, here we have two classes represented by the different shapes, and we're trying to find a model that captures the boundary that best separates these two different classes. Supervised learning can also be about regression, or making predictions on a continuous valued output. In these cases, the line itself represents the prediction being made by the model, instead of it being a boundary. Beyond supervised learning, there's also unsupervised learning. Here, we're working with unlabeled data so we don't know the value of the outcome for our different target instances. Unsupervised learning is usually focused on data exploration and looking for patterns in general between the variables in our data set. Unsupervised learning includes things like clustering and dimensionality reduction, such as principal component analysis. Lastly, there's reinforcement learning. This is something we'll run into less in medical research, but it might have a real relevant role to play in the future. Reinforcement learning is primarily interested in dealing with multi-step problems. In other words, problems where you have to make a series of decisions and you don't know whether that set of decisions was right or wrong until you've reached some endpoint. Another way of looking at this is that you don't get feedback every time you're forced to make a decision. Think of a game of chess. I don't know if my first pawn move was a good one until we reach the end of the game and we find out whether I've won. Presumably, the movement of every single piece in sequence played some role in the outcome of whether I won or lost. This kind of learning is arguably the hardest because we have to deal with how to reward or punish the different steps that were taken earlier on to determine whether that series of steps was ultimately a good strategy. Another thing to clarify when we're talking about machine learning algorithms is that there are many different families of methods and literally hundreds, maybe thousands, of different implementations of each of these methods and algorithms. In other words, machine learning isn't just one strategy. It's a huge family of methodologies. Here we have some different pictographic representations of different subsets of machine learning strategies. For example, we have decision trees, support vector machines, rule-based machine learning, artificial neural networks, and many others. Notably, even this is not an exhaustive list of all machine learning families. Researchers are constantly inventing and developing new approaches or variants of approaches every year. Now that we've taken a quick, broad look at machine learning, let's refocus on trees and in particular, a very simple kind of machine learning known as the decision tree. When we're talking about decision trees, the first thing to note is that they're both a representation as well as a machine learning strategy. The most basic definition of a decision tree is a flowchart-like graph structure where each internal node represents a test on an attribute. Each branch represents the outcome of the test, so in other words, the first test might be, does it move, yes or no. Each branch represents the outcome of the test of some attribute. You can relate this to the truth or falsehood of propositions from propositional logic. Further, in the tree, each bottom or leaf node represents a consequent. So here at the bottom we have different leaf nodes and we have a series of questions. Does it move? Yes. Should it? No. And our consequent is use duct tape. In a decision tree, the decision is taken after computing all attributes in a path down the tree, as we've just seen. A decision tree can be applied as a decision support tool or a way to present already known information for decision making and to evaluate their consequences or cost. So in this above very simple tree, we've taken our own prior knowledge and we've created a tree from it. No learning has taken place. We've just taken our knowledge and a decision making process, structured it as a decision tree. However, decision trees can also be applied as a supervised machine learning algorithm to model and predict outcomes. So in this situation, we might build a tree in sequence using a set of training data to do so. For example, you could train a tree that looks something like this. Is sex male, yes or no? If they're not, then in this case, the majority of people survive. If they're not a male and their age is over nine years, then most of the time they've passed away. Notice in this case that our consequence are survived or died, 
and the percentages below indicate the proportion of individuals that died given the conditions that were satisfied in the branch up from that leaf node to the top of the tree. At this point, let's cover some different decision tree terminology. First off, let's talk about different kinds of nodes. A root node of the tree has access to all instances in the data set. It will ultimately get divided into two or more sets. Another way of looking at a root node is that all training instances will start here and any instances that will need to be predictive in the future will enter the tree here. Below the root node are decision nodes. These occur when nodes split into further subnodes. Decision nodes are also called sub, internal, split, or chance nodes. Leaf nodes, or the ones here at the bottom of the tree, are nodes that don't split. These will give a class or some average value as a prediction output of the tree. Leaf nodes are also referred to as terminal nodes or outcome nodes. The term parent and child refer to where nodes exist in the hierarchy. Parent nodes will split into two or more offspring nodes, and parent nodes occur above offspring nodes. The term splitting is a process of dividing a node into two or more subnodes. So a splitting event takes place here, and then subsequently here or here, or here. We can use the term branch or subtree to describe an entire subsection of the tree. And lastly, the terms levels or depth refer to the number of splits through a given path down the tree. For example, the root node would be at level 1, the next set of decision nodes would be at level 2, the next decision node and the leaf nodes from above would be level 3, and so forth. From this point on, we're going to think about decision trees from the perspective of machine learning, where we're trying to train a tree from scratch rather than hard code one with our own expert knowledge. Training trees takes on a divide and conquer approach. So when we start trying to train a tree, we'll start by picking the best root node possible. We try and find an attribute that, al that best allows us to split up the instances in our data set. Commonly, the test of a node could be an attribute value compared to a constant. For example, x equals one. That's the question we're asking or the test we're asking at that node. However, you could also compare the values of two attributes or use a function of one or more attributes as the test at a node. Leaves represent the consequent, and these can output a conclusion, a class, an action, or some set of these. When it comes to classification, these consequents don't just give the class prediction, but they represent a probability distribution specifying the support or the certainty of a given class outcome. We'll get to consider this line of thinking more when we get to reasoning with uncertainty in a later lecture. Whenever we have a new instance that we want to make a prediction on using our tree, it comes in through the root node, and based on the values of that instance, we answer each test and find a path through the tree until we get to the right consequent, which is our ultimate decision made by the decision tree. Notably, that new instance has to have the attribute values that are specified in the tree. In other words, if the instance that comes in doesn't have a value of x, then we can't proceed. You can kind of think of this process as being similar to instantiation from logic. Staying on the theme of logic, you can think of decision trees as a hierarchy of implications. For example, if x equals 1 and y equals 0, then a. This implication describes a specific path through the tree to a conclusion A. Here we have all four of the implications that describe the four different paths through this decision tree. Effectively, from the perspective of logic, a decision tree can be viewed as a disjunction of conjunctions of constraints on the attribute values of an instance. The of constraints on attribute values alludes to the fact that we're assigning these variables specific values. The disjunction component of this definition alludes to the fact that there are multiple ways to end up as A or to end up as B. Let's take a quick step back and look at how decision trees can be split based on whether we're looking at a categorical or a numerical feature. In this example, we have a categorical feature, specifically sex. For the purpose of this illustration, let's imagine that we only have sex as male and female, and thus we have a split defined by a discrete value. So here our test is sex, and we can either go one branch or the other. For continuous valued features, such as age, we'll define this split with some kind of cutoff, for example, age greater than 25, again giving us some discrete number of choices to proceed further down the tree. A little bit more on categorical or nominal features, the number of child nodes, for example, here in this example of weather, connecting to sunny, cloudy, or rainy, 
usually equals the number of possible attribute values. Also, when it comes to nominal values, an attribute typically won't be examined more than once. So we won't see in this case whether pop up again lower in the tree. When it comes to numeric or continuous valued features, as we saw, we test whether a value is greater or less than a constant. But as a result, that attribute might get examined or tested multiple times. So for example here, pedal length is less than or equal to 2.45, gives us our first split. But then we might further split pedal width based on it being less than 1.75. It's also good to note that we can have more than two-way splits in decision trees, as we see here when weather is split into sunny, cloudy, or rainy. However, whether you can do this is based on the implementation of that specific decision tree algorithm. Now let's take a look at how decision trees operate based on the outcome that's being examined. So here we have an example of age being greater than 16, yes or no. In this case, our outcome is binary, either being classified as yes or no. So for example, in this case, maybe we're trying to predict can a person drive. The proportions you see below each leaf node indicates the probability that you will have that specific class based on the probabilities from the original training data from which this tree was learned. Notably, decision trees can also do multi-class classification beyond just binary class classification. So for example, you could have yes, no, or maybe as three outcome classes. In contrast with classification, when trees are tasked with performing regression, in other words, predicting a continuous value, we're no longer dealing with probabilities that individuals belong to one class or another from the original training set. Instead, we look at all the individuals that ended up in this leaf node and take the average value of the outcome variable of all individuals that were left in that leaf. This becomes the prediction for all individuals that end up in this leaf in the future. During the process of training trees, it's the goal in classification to get these probabilities of being in one class or another as high or as low as possible. Differently, when we're training a tree for regression, our goal is to get subgroups of instances with the lowest mean squared error between their actual values and the average value. Now let's focus a little bit more on building decision trees. As I mentioned, they can be constructed by hand, where you can represent decision logic through the branches of a tree. Here you're basically laying out known knowledge to conduct a form of deductive reasoning. But typically, decision trees are learned via induction. So again, we provide examples where we have different features or attributes with values, as well as some resulting outcome, because we're doing supervised learning, so we need this outcome label. Then we need the algorithm to construct a tree from these examples. We're trying to form a generalized model of the examples. Notably, induction doesn't guarantee correct decision tree. When it comes to a decision tree, learning is non-incremental, which means that we can't learn one instance at a time. Instead, we need a batch or a group of training instances from which to learn from all at once. For reference, an algorithm called ID3 is the basic learning algorithm behind most decision trees. Something called C4.5 is an updated and extended version of this. Let's take a look at the process of tree induction. First off, let's make a couple of observations. If X is true in every example that results in action A, then X must always be true for action A. Basically, this says that in a training set, if a feature is always predictive of an outcome, then the model has to capture that relationship. When training machine learning algorithms, including decision trees, more examples are always going to be better, and errors or noise in the data will always cause difficulty. These models, as generalizers, ultimately say that X must still ultimately always be true. In general, the ID3 algorithm does a pretty good job of handling errors or noise in examples. Of note, different machine learning algorithms are better or worse at handling noise in data. Of course, note that induction can result in errors. It could just be a coincidence that X is true in all of your examples. During the process of learning a decision tree, the algorithm is always trying to determine what attribute tests are always true for each action. That's the ideal situation, even if it rarely happens. The assumption is if that value of X is true again, then you should have the same action as a result. Of course, induction requires examples. So where do these come from? Well, a programmer or a designer could simulate or provide examples. If you're trying to conduct machine learning in terms of gameplay, you could capture an expert player's action and the game state while they're playing, or you could just start with a data set of working training examples. The number of examples that you'll need depends on the difficulty of the concept or the pattern in your data. 
By difficulty, we mean the number of tests to determine the action, or the classification. Again, more is really always better. A quick note that when you're conducting training, you always want to set aside some data that you're not training on to evaluate your model after the fact. This brings us to the idea of a training versus a testing set. In any machine learning, you want to train on some larger proportion of the data, let's say 75% of the total examples. And then you'll use the rest to validate the learned decision tree or other machine learning algorithm by estimating how well that tree does on examples it hasn't yet seen. Now let's look at the recursive process that these trees take to be trained. Starting from the root node, we want to find an attribute test that best separates the actions or the predictions. Then we're going to recurse or repeat that procedure on the subsequent subsets. So for example, if we first split individuals in our data set by age, now we have two new subgroups of people from our original data set. Next, we'll find another test to further split these and break our individuals into even further subgroups. So what does it mean to separate? Well, the goal here is to get individuals into subgroups that are more homogeneously part of a similar or the same class or outcome. So the thing to measure here is entropy, or the degree of homogeneity, or lack thereof it, in a set or a subset. So again, beginning from the root node, a decision tree recursively finds the variable that best divides a data into outcomes. This is called Hunt's algorithm. We define the best variable for the split to be determined heuristically by a number of different possible metrics, including the GD index, information gain, chi-square test, and variance reduction. So again, we can leverage one of these tests to identify the most homogeneous or pure subgroup in terms of the outcome labels. And we do this until some stop criteria is met. For example, we could stop once the tree has reached some maximum depth. Or we could stop when all the leaves of the tree are completely pure. For example, they only specify one of the available classes. Let's take a closer look at one of these indexes for calculating homogeneity of these groups. In particular, the Gini index. So the Gini index is something used by CART, and zero is considered to be the best score, or the most homogeneous subgroup. Starting with all the instances, we evaluate all variables in the data set and compare their Gini index. We then pick the one with the lowest score, or the minimal impurity, and that forms the basis for our first split in the tree. Let's suppose for a moment that we're trying to predict who plays cricket and who doesn't. Starting with a group of 30 students, half of them play cricket and half of them don't. At this point, we're going to try and pick the test for our root node. In other words, which variable in our data set best splits up the students so that there's a pure group of plays or doesn't play cricket. First, we're going to consider splitting by gender. So in this case, our test asks whether you're male or female and does the split. In this case, we find that the female group comprised of 10 students has only two that play cricket, or 20% of the women. In the male group consisting of 20 students, we find that 13 play cricket, or 65%. Using that example, let's go through the Gini index score calculation. First, we calculate the Gini for the subnode female. Here, we take the probability that you play cricket and square it, and add it to the probability that you don't play cricket. This gives us 0.68. Now, we'll score the Gini for the subnode male. Here, 65% play cricket and 35% don't. Adding the squares of those two values gives us 0.55. Finally, we calculate the weighted Gini based on the proportion of students that ended up in either of these nodes. So, from the female group, our 0.68 is multiplied by 10 out of 30, since 10 out of the 30 individuals were women. And our 0.55 gets multiplied by 20 over 30, because 20 out of our 30 students were male. This gives us a final Gini impurity of 0.59. We can complete a similar calculation by splitting on class, in this case class 9 or class 10. And if we go through these calculations, we get a Gini value of 0.51. Since the Gini impurity is 1 minus this Gini value, we're trying to maximize the Gini value or minimize the Gini impurity. So in this example, the better split is to split by gender in order to best discriminate between who plays cricket. As mentioned before, if we're trying to conduct regression using a decision tree, in other words, predict a continuous valued outcome, then picking the right test is all about minimizing the sum of squares from the average of individuals that end up in these different subgroups. Ultimately, the goal is to have homogeneous samples of individuals with very similar continuous valued outcomes within each of these different leaf nodes.
Let's take a quick look at how each of these splits going down a decision tree could be visualized within a problem space. Here on the left, we have a classification problem where we're trying to discriminate between green and blue circles. Notice that they form sort of a yin-yang pattern. In this case, the decision tree finds as its first root node, y is greater than 0.5. This could be represented by this horizontal line. Now we have either yes in green above or no in blue below. Next, we can subsequently add the test x is greater than 0.8, represented by this line, and x is less than 0.3, represented by this line. That means that this group here under yes corresponds to this part of the subspace of the problem. Notice that all circles in this part of the search space are purely blue circles, and so we don't need to subdivide this branch any further. Here in this node, covering this part of the search space, we do a pretty good job of identifying all blues with one exceptional green right here. However, we could still decide to stop breaking this branch apart because we've reached a certain level of purity and it's not necessary to go any further. In this part of the subspace, we've similarly captured all greens correctly so we can stop. But this remaining square at this position has a pretty good mix of blues and greens that we still might want to discriminate. So now we have this part of the tree that we're trying to branch a bit further. At a depth of five, the tree might represent something that looks like this. And maybe after learning a depth of 10, we might do a really good job discriminating between one class and the other. When thinking about using trees or decision trees in artificial intelligence in general, we could think of using a group of trees as being polled anytime the AI is called, asking each tree for its opinion on an output. Each tree might only be called when some state changes in the environment or we have a new instance that we want to make a prediction on. This makes it event driven. To use trees to make decisions in a real-world problem, you'll always need the current value of each input attribute that's represented in the tree. Maybe you'll need sensor inputs to describe the state of the world if you're working with some autonomous device. At this point, let's take a quick review of decision tree advantages and disadvantages. On the plus side, we have that they're simpler, more compact representations than most of what we've looked at so far. Ultimately, they're easy to create, understand, and to interpret and they can also be represented or transformed into a set of rules, as we'll see in the next lecture. They also provide an intuitive visualization strategy for knowledge and reasoning as a decision-making process. The trees themselves mirror human decision-making more closely than some other knowledge representations. And trees can be either learned or engineered from the ground up using prior expert knowledge. In terms of disadvantages, decision trees can be difficult to engineer rather than to train, they can be very difficult to update with new knowledge. In other words, you might be forced to build a brand new tree from scratch rather than having the ability to update an existing tree. Trees may not be suitable for representing large knowledge bases. And when it comes to learning by induction, they need as many examples as possible to train. Learned decision trees can contain errors like most machine learning algorithms. Again, like most machine learning algorithms, they're prone to overfitting when trained. And importantly, only one attribute at a time is tested for making a decision as the tree is being built. This makes them not suited to detecting complex associations or interactions between predictive variables. At this point, let's take a brief tour of some other tree-based machine learning methods that you might be familiar with or heard of. The decision tree, which we just covered, has led to a number of other more advanced tree-based machine learning strategies. We'll start with the idea of ensembles and bagging and how these led to the development of random forests. Then we'll discuss boosting and how that's formed something called adaptive boosting, as well as gradient boosting, which has given us some of the most sophisticated tree-based machine learners to date, including the algorithm XGBoost. First off, ensembles. An ensemble is simply a collection or a group of models that are trained on the same task. This can be many versions of the same type of representation or model or different kinds of representation or models. So in other words, it could be a bunch of decision trees or a set of different machine learning algorithms all brought together to make predictions. Through this collection of models, a final prediction is made by some kind of weighted average or vote between the group. Typically, ensembles of different models that achieve similar generalization performance often outperforms any of the individual models on their own. But how? Well, Imagine for a second that we have a set of binary classifiers, and each classifier has the same average error that is better than randomly guessing. Now, if we also assume that these errors that are being made are independent, 
we now have this intuition that the majority of the classifiers should be correct on many examples where an individual would have made a mistake on its own. So a simple majority vote can ultimately improve overall classification performance by decreasing the variance in this setting. So how do we go about training such an ensemble? Well, as a precursor to this, let's quickly take a look at bootstrapping. This is an idea that comes from statistics. Bootstrapping is widely used to quantify uncertainty associated with a model. So starting from some original sample, we can take further bootstrap samples. And from these, we can evaluate a target statistic. These are known as bootstrap statistics. We could then examine this distribution of statistics, allowing us to estimate standard error and a confidence interval for some coefficient. In a related way, there's the idea of bagging and bagged trees. This is also known as bootstrap aggregation. The goal here again is to reduce variance. Ultimately, we're attempting to train independent classifiers by sampling from the training set. So if this is our original training set, we're going to create random subsets of that training set from which independent classifiers will be trained. This collection of classifiers together gives us our final model. This process is known as bagging and can be completed with decision trees. Armed with this idea of bagging, let's take this a step further and explore what defines a random forest. Random forests are essentially a successful extension of this idea of bagged trees. They're a go-to algorithm and considered to be a panacea of almost any machine learning problem. Ultimately, they work pretty well across most problems, but they're not always going to work best. Random forests are considered to be an extension of bagging because they not only look at subsets of training instance, but they also consider random subsets of features when deciding what variables to split on in the respective training of different trees. Once the random forest is trained and a new instance comes along that we want to make a prediction on, that instance is passed to all trees in the forest and all of their prediction outcomes are brought together as a collective decision. Random forests allow us to value the importance of any given feature, which is basically an estimate of that single variable's contribution to classification across all trees in the random forest. Here's a quick illustration of random forest training. First, we start with an original training set and we apply bootstrap sampling to create training subsets. On each of these training subsets, we build models. Each of these models only have access to a random set of features in the original data set. And lastly, we have bootstrap aggregation, where the predictions of all of these models are brought together in order to make a final prediction. Now let's take this a step further and move into the idea of boosting. At its heart, boosting is an ensemble meta-algorithm for combining weak learners to create a strong one. Boosting adopts a form of iterative learning where we start with a weak learner and build from it sequentially. So for example, let's say this is our data set and we start with a weak classifier, which might just be a simple line threshold trying to discriminate the plus signs from the minus signs. At this point, we look at the instances we predicted well or predicted poorly. Each iteration, data weights are updated to focus more on any misclassified instances. So for example, going from this first attempt to the second, these three pluses were incorrectly classified, so now they have a higher weight in terms of being classified correctly. So now we have our second weak learner, this boundary. At this point, there are three negatives that were incorrectly classified, so now they are upweighted more. And our pluses are now downweighted to some degree because we've now correctly classified them. This process continues until we get some final meta-classifier that is a combination of all these weak learners. Notably, this approach is extremely sensitive to the problem of overfitting. So any noise or outliers can really lead to problems in running this kind of algorithm. One of the best known versions of a boosting tree-based algorithm is this one called Adaboost. Here we can see how a bunch of weak learners are combined into a very complex prediction model. The last thing we're going to look at in tree-based methods is gradient boosting. Gradient boosting is a variation on the boosting idea we just learned about. Instead of training on weighted instance, the weak learner trains on the remaining errors or so-called pseudo-residuals of the strong meta-learner. Conceptually, you could think of it as starting with a weak learner and then training a new model based on everything it did wrong. Then that new model is built upon further again training on the errors of the one that came before it, making a model more complex, more sophisticated, and more accurate as it goes. Gradient boosting is ultimately just another way of giving importance to the difficult instances to classify.
Here, the contribution of the weak learner to the strong one isn't computed according to its performance on the new distribution sample, but using a gradient descent optimization process. Here, the computed contribution is the one minimizing the overall error of the strong learner. One of the best known and most successful of these gradient boosting tree-based methods is called XGBoost. It uses a regularized gradient boosting method and parallel computing to make it faster and more effective. There's also another variant called LGBoost that has become very popular in the last couple years. Overall, this section of the lecture is just meant to introduce you to some of the connections between different tree-based machine learning algorithms. Feel free to go and dive into them more if you're interested in learning about them in more detail. Here's a summary of today's lecture. We began by learning about semantic webs. We looked at some terminology and how this idea is focused on linking databases, ontologies, data, and research across the web. We also learned about some of the resources and strategies to move towards this goal of a semantic web, including things like RDF, OWL, and description logics. Next, we learned about tree representations. And we talked a little bit about how we can build them either with expert knowledge or through induction via machine learning. We also learned about some tree-based terminology, structure, and their links to logic. And lastly, in trees, we talked about how they're built and how we can apply induction to generate them. Lastly, we took a tour of some other tree-based machine learning methods, talking about the concepts of ensembles, bagging, and boosting. Here's today's quote, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, so is a lot. Just a quick reminder that your midterm paper summaries will be due soon. Please check the syllabus for the specific date. As always, thank you for listening, and I'll see you in the next lecture.